Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Oregon's ocean champion and our representative, Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the Congresswoman represents an area of Northwest uh, Oregon that includes a variety of habitats, our somewhat rural coastal region, the Willamette Valley, and the <coughs> thriving area of Portland, which has a lot of technology and entrepreneurship. So her purview is quite diverse. Since she was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2009, uh, she's been chosen by her peers to serve in several very important leadership roles. They include the second-ranking Democrat on the House Education and Workforce Committee with recognized leadership in advancing STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art, opportunities and impacts. She also serves as a ranking member of the House Science, Space, and Technology Subcommittee on the Environment. And in this role, she's responsible for providing wide-ranging leadership that affects the federal research enterprise, including NOAA, uh, climate change research, all activities related to the weather and weather services, our fisheries and our oceans, and NASA, to name just a few. And this year, she's added a new role as co-chair of the Bipartisan Oceans Caucus in the House, which is something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts. Through these efforts, she's been a very strong voice for our community and our shared mission to drive and shape the future of ocean science, technology, and research that we know will benefit generations to come. Importantly, she has stood up for the importance of climate change science, for the peer-reviewed integrity of NSF-funded research, including the geosciences, and for the necessary but important balance between science infrastructure and research. She is tireless and committed to the diverse issues concerning our oceans, climate, and environment, and our coastal communities. And so I'm pleased to have her with us today to give us a few remarks. I'm pleased to have her voice in Congress as a representative of Oregon and a champion for our coasts and our ocean uh, nationwide. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you for your patience in waiting for me. I was in a markup um, all morning, and uh, if, I, if my chief of staff waves at me and I run, it's because they're they've called some votes. It's a very busy time on the Hill, but it really is an honor to be with you here today um, to talk about the great work that you're doing. And as you heard in the introduction, I am truly honored to be the co-chair of the Bipartisan Oceans Caucus, working with Representative Young from Alaska. And I've been working with Representative Young currently on the Tsunami Warning Education Research Act. So we uh, have had a conversation about what the caucus will be looking at and focusing on and some of the issues that we'll be discussing are the IUU, illegal unreported unregulated fishing, marine debris, and Representative Young from Alaska has a lot of coastline, as you know, uh, ocean acidification, coastal economies, fisheries, weather and natural disasters that threaten coastal communities and uh, wildlife. So as you heard in the introduction, I represent the northwest part of the state of Oregon, and I have the north coast in the district I represent. Uh, it is an economy that relies on uh, tourism, fishing. Uh, we are doing some great work with renewable wave energy, uh, and Oregon State University is a leader in that research as well. Uh, to feed the future and have productive oceans, it's really important to address the threats to our oceans uh, and the sustainability. Uh, in fall of 2016, New England experienced its first ever shellfish harvesting closures, and that was from Maine to Rhode Island. Uh, we, we are extremely concerned about that, and on the West Coast, we were plagued with delays and closures in the Dungeness crab industry, which is uh, one of the most important in our, our region and the West Coast. And in Florida, Lake Erie, and many more places, there have been, as you know, problems with harmful algal blooms and bloom toxicity. So in Congress, a couple years ago, I had a bipartisan piece of legislation I worked on with Representative Posey from Florida for um, harmful algal bloom research. 
And uh, that was signed into law by President Obama, and I'm working with my colleagues to reintroduce legislation for additional HABs research so we can better understand and address that threat. We, uh, we need to support coastal science and <coughs> restoration research, like the Sea Grant and external grant programs. I'm uh, very concerned and, well, dismayed, disappointed by the, well, we saw a leaked memo. There's daily changes in what is happening up here on the Hill. Uh, the, the memo proposes getting NOAA funding by about 17%. It laid out about a 26% cut to the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. 5% cut to National Marine Fishery Services and National Weather Service, eliminates the Sea Grant program. Um, so the, the fiscal year 18 appropriations process is really just beginning and that we expect to see the President's budget. And we've, we've heard the sort of general parameters and increase in defense spending, but not raising taxes, so that means cutting everything else. Um, I am planning to fight uh, those cuts every step of the way and as we go forward with the appropriations process we are, are looking for input from our constituents about priorities but making sure uh, that we get the message across where we need to invest and why these investments are important and why it's very short-sighted uh, to gut NOAA funding and these other cuts that you are, are hearing about. Uh, I remember trying to convince uh, my inland colleagues the we have a new chair now on the, on the Environment Subcommittee, but my former chair was from Oklahoma. And I tried to convince him, I know you don't have any coastline, but your constituents want to buy shellfish when they go to the grocery store. They want to go into a restaurant and be, be able to order shellfish. So you need to care about these issues as well for, for ocean health. Um, and I will continue that message to, to really reach our uh, our constituents on both sides of the aisle and across the country. Uh, we have a hearing, I believe it's tomorrow, um, if it's not tomorrow, it's soon, on NSF. I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow. Um, sorry, I've been in this markup all day talking about health care reform. So we have a hearing coming up in the Science Committee on the National Science Foundation. Um, I was honored a couple of years ago to travel with NSF and the committee chair on the Science Committee and several of my colleagues to Antarctica. Uh, amazing trip and learned a lot and I know that uh, in the hearing with the NSF we'll be uh, advocating for, for their funding uh, and for not having their funding or any of this other science funding micromanaged by members of Congress. Um, so we have threats of marine debris of course, warming and more acidic ocean waters, sea level rise, climate change, overfishing and so much more and our oceans need strong advocates. So on the Science Committee's Environment Subcommittee, I admit we've had our challenges because we do have climate change deniers on the committee. But again, we continue to use science and research to try to convince our colleagues uh, that yes, climate change is real, humans contribute to it, and we need to address it. So I know that the health of our natural resources, especially our marine resources, so, are so critical and I'll be pushing for investments in research as I mentioned to predict and adapt to these challenges and I know Oregon State really stepped up, stepped up and helped our shellfish industry adapt to ocean acidification. We have this great company Whiskey Creek Shellfish and you know, Oregon State really helped them with, the, with how they adapt. So we do have new challenges of course in this Congress and with this administration but I look forward to working with all of you on issues we care about, the oceans as a global food source, changing climate and ecosystems, and ocean research. So of course we need to work in a bipartisan fashion. That's what I've done since I've joined Congress. You know, I was in the majority in the state legislature, always been in the minority here. And the way I look at it is my constituents expect me to get things done if I'm in the minority as well as <laughs> if I'm in the majority. And I've always reached out and found partners, which is how we got the HABs bill done. I have bipartisan support on the Tsunami Warning Education Research Act. We need to continue. Uh, again, uh, in that bipartisan focus, and I am also co-leading the Estuary Caucus with Representative Posey from Florida as well. So there's caucuses about many issues, but understanding the importance of estuaries, uh, I'm co-leading that Estuaries Caucus. So this is really an opportunity. Your being here will help us inform the administration about the importance of ocean health, 
and how it feeds our planet. So thank you so much for all you do. Uh, and again, my apologies for, for coming in in the middle of an, another program, but I think I have time for a, a couple of questions before I have to run out to vote. I'm not getting the signal from my staff yet. So. <laughs> Do I, Rachel, do I have time for a couple questions? Or did they call votes? Oh, I do have time. Does anybody have any questions? Wow. Easy group. Yes. How do we help people? So how, how can you help? I encourage you to, to um, raise your voices, amplify your voices, and being together with an organization and, and with this wonderful Oceans Leadership Group helps, but uh, we need to hear from people. Sometimes people say, well, I don't need to contact you because I know you support this research, or I know, I know you believe in climate change. But it's really critical for all of us, our, all of our representatives and senators, to hear from our constituents. Whether you agree with us or not, it's really helpful. And I get reports from my constituents, and I, it, I just did a town hall meeting on Friday in McMinnville, Oregon, and I could say these are the top, you know, five issues that people are contacting me about. So, do not hesitate to, you know, you're you're all engaged already by being here, but don't hesitate to continue to let your elected representatives know your priorities and join other organizations that align with your values and help amplify your voices. But thank you. Yes. Question. Thank you. I'm John White, the president of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Uh, thanks so much for coming here and taking time out of a busy day. We really appreciate it. Uh, as we've raised up this issue of oceans and food security, I've had a lot of a lot of conversations with people in the agricultural business and the mm -hmm. agricultural lobby, and I believe there's a great opportunity to sort of merge together somewhat the ocean lobby, if you will, the ocean right. caucuses and the agricultural. But it seems the agricultural sort of that's a large machine that's been up and running. I guess my question is, do you see opportunities there? Or do you think we can do that? What can we do to help sort of I think bring those two groups right. together a little better? Absolutely, there are opportunities there, and even though I'm not on the Agriculture Committee, we'll be working with people, and well, I'm on the Education Committee, and the Department of Agriculture uh, works on school nutrition, for example. So there's a lot of opportunity to partner there and to help get the message across to our friends in the agriculture community that you know the oceans are an enormous source of, of food for people around the world. So we can partner in that way and, and form alliances. You know, it's one of the reasons why um, the SNAP program or food stamps is typically put in uh, the farm bill to try to bring those partners together and sort of bridge, do the urban rural bridge, although we all know that hunger isn't just an urban problem. Uh, so when we find those partnerships, it, it really does help. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I know pe when people think about you know, agriculture, they, they sometimes just default to things like grain or meat, and we absolutely need to to expand that to make sure that we're talking about the importance of, of uh, food that comes from the oceans as well. Lots of opportunity. Yes? So you were talking to some of your say, um, Republican colleagues about the importance of ocean sciences and the importance of the ocean for food security. What are some of the best messages to be effective with that audience and that you have had with your colleagues? And then if you, are, um, if you are aware of it, what are some of the effective messages that their constituents have been uh, um, saying to them and what has gotten them to yes to support ocean science, looking at, you know, say, changing oceans and that sort of thing? Well, uh, certainly, thank you. I, certainly, I'll, I'll answer the first part, and I, I don't really know about the, the second part as much as my, my, my co rural colleagues are, well, well, actually, I have rural uh, areas of my district, but but how we tend to get through is continued conversations and building relationships, and and the the trip for Antar to Antarctica, for example, is one way that I helped build relationships with people on the science committee. Uh, you know, you hear this this notion that members of Congress don't spend time together anymore. Um, and we don't as much as they used to before jet planes took people <laughs> home on the weekends and people used to stay here and get to know each other better. So it's building those relationships and then having the conversations like I mentioned with um, my colleague from the Science Committee who's from Oklahoma, which it doesn't have ocean coast. And so trying to explain to people it, this isn't just about coastal areas and coastal uh, issues. It's a, it affects the whole country and the health of our oceans reflects the health of our planet. So it's primarily building relationships and having those conversations. 
we, we are um, a little more polarized than we were even in the last couple of years that I've been here right now. Uh, but I am committed to fighting back against that because that's how we're going to get things done is to make sure that we do reach out and find common ground with people. So uh, the messages are, are just uh, talking about, for example, with ocean acidification. Sometimes I've said, let's, let's just have a hearing on it. Let's find out what, how, how it's affecting our industries. And if, if, if they don't want to about, talk about what's causing it because they don't believe in climate change, well, let's talk about what we do about it, which it, from a scientific perspective is not the right approach. But if it's all we can get to start with, I'll take it. So we might have to take one step at a time. So we'll just continue to have those conversations, continue to use research, continue to use data. But right now, we're, just, we're fighting for the research as well to make sure that we have that research that we need. Yes? Yeah, I uh, long ago had done with Dalhousie University in Halifax in Canada. And as we've heard over and over again today, the U.S. consumes some um, of their seafood. About 95% of the seafood is uh, sourced outside of the domestic uh, right, right. boundaries of the United States there. And the current administration seems intent on renegotiating all of their trade arrangements I've around heard the that. world. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I'm, uh, <laughs> as, as coming from a country who is trying their best to <laughs> fill the needs of the United States in terms of seafood, I wonder if you could comment on any implications that there might be on future trade negotiations. Thank you. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as somebody who represents a very trade-dependent district in the Pacific Northwest, I followed very closely all of the conversations about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which became, of course, very controversial for many reasons. But it, it actually had some really great ocean protections in there and, and pr provisions against overfishing and that kind of thing. But that, you know, it, 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 it is not going to go anywhere right now, uh, as, as far as we can tell. All I can say is when negotiations began again, um, I'm going to do as I did with giving input in the, over the past several years about a trade agreement has to be good for workers. It has to have ocean protections and environmental protections and consumer protections and labor protections. But I don't know what's going to happen uh, under the current administration. Uh, my, uh, one of the things I've heard that is that there may be more bilater bilateral rather than multilateral um, trade agreements. I, I think that some people sort of miss the fact that Canada and Mexico were part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So there were re renegotiations going on already. But now when the president says, I want to renegotiate NAFTA, maybe you can just look at some of the work that was done. Uh, but it, it, again, there's, I think the only thing that's certain is that there's a lot of uncertainty right now. But, but please know that uh, many of us who do represent trade-dependent coastal districts will be fighting for those, those protections. And I've always said I want a, a, a good trade agreement that's good for, for my state and for, for my workers. But we want to also recognize that we're in a global, global economy. So, oh, now I have to go vote. Okay, votes were called. So anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciate that you're here today. Thank you for all of your great work, and I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, in the years to come. Thank you.